thank you for watching that greetings and welcome yes it's been indeed an amazing year and almost unbelievable but yes a year is over and we are here celebrating the completion of that year with a special anniversary edition for this day we have two very special uh, people who are here with us to present the first one of course is a very young trailblazer of oral pathology dr merva texan She's very well known for her many contributions. We have also heard her in the IAOP conference uh, holding a very interesting debate on some uh, lesions. And today, she, in fact, she's even contributed to the channel itself, although many may not have realized it then, considering she, in keeping with the times, she was masked and she was, she was the masked contributor in the panel for Dr. Keats uh, talk on CEOT. If you didn't notice it or if you didn't see it or you didn't recognize her, please go back and watch it. There's still a chance you can see it. And then to introduce her, we have with us uh, Dr. Raghu Radhakrishnan, who I have just given him the title of Moderator-in-Chief because he's been moderating so many sessions now. So, yes, Dr. Raghu, who is a part of the Manipal University, he is also Director of Interna International Affairs and a Professor in Oral Pathology. Yes, I will ask him to please introduce Merva and start. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Mandana, am I audible? Yes, you are. So, thank you, uh, Mandana, for uh, bestowing this honor to moderate this special event marking the first anniversary of Oral Pathology India and Oral Pathology 360. Congratulations to you on achieving this fabulous milestone. So on this memorable occasion, I can't help admiring you for your commitment to promoting oral pathology around the globe. Thank you for giving us multiple opportunities to be the show stoppers, choosing to always stay behind the screen May you continue the journey of success with pride. Moving on, respected colleagues, invited guests, and dear students. On behalf of Oral Pathology India and Oral Pathology 360, I deem it an honor and rare privilege to introduce an academic leader who does more than just lead. She's driven by the right motivation and makes a positive impact on people around her. After acquiring her graduate and doctoral training in tumor pathology from Istanbul University, she was an overseas training fellow with General Dental Council registration at Guy's Hospital and King's College, London. She was the first TFI international training fellow in dentistry to complete her training in the United Kingdom. She is the fellow of the Istanbul Dentistry Association, Turkish Pathology Society, Federation of Turkish Pathology Society's Head and Neck Working Group, International Association of Oral Pathologists, and the British Society for Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology. She was the secretary of the local organizing committee of the 17th International Congress on Oral Pathology. She served as the European Councillor of IAOP between 2014 and 2020, and is currently serving as a digital communication officer of IAOP. A committed academic who has to her credit many high quality research publications and book chapters, including the fourth and the fifth edition of the WHO classification of head and neck tumors. Very recently, she was conferred the Distinguished Visiting Professor title by Tehran University of Medical Sciences. For her exceptional contribution to the field of oral pathology, Turkish Academy of Science presented her with the Outstanding Young Scientist Award in the field of medical sciences in 2019. Her research interest includes odontogenic tumors and cysts, bone pathologies, diagnostics in oral cancer and oral potentially malignant disorders. It's with great pride I present a wonder woman of oral pathology and a woman with a voice who has carved a niche for herself, contributing significantly to the growth of our specialty presenting to you a good friend and a great colleague, Dr. Merva Soluk Tekesin. Over to you, Dr. Merva. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really embarrassed. Thank you so much for this 
description. And uh, thank you, Rago, as you said that, my, as a, my friend and as a, my colleague. And Dr. Mandana, thank you very much for your nice, kind invitation. And you made a very big job during the one year. Uh, and my hearty congratulations to you in, on behalf of all oral pathology world. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here with you. Okay, I'm sharing my screen now. Uh, again, thank you so much for the Indian Oral Pathology Committee for this kind invitation. Today we are going to discuss the approach to odontogenic tumor uh, briefly. I just selected the uh, butter and bread cases just to see how we can approach the odontogenic tumor in our daily routine. Uh, before I start my presentation, I just want to say a few words for the India, my visiting of India. And in 2016, I was in Chennai for the IIOP Congress. I have to say that I really impressed by your historical and secret buildings. But unfortunately, uh, I haven't got the time to see the Taj Mahal. Uh, it is the, I think, true love structure of the world, or in other words, it is the most expensive love. Uh, so I think I have to go back to uh, India to visit uh, Taj Mahal again. And I hope uh, these difficult days uh, goes uh, closely and uh, quickly and I visit India again because I have really good memories from that country. And I want to share a very special pictures with you as a woman, of course. I just uh, go to the, uh, some clothes uh, uh, do and... Um, uh, after the sailor made me this model, you can see here, I found myself like that. And I bought a suitcase full of Indian fabric when I come to the Istanbul. So uh, I really impressed by all of these colorful uh, clothes and especially the, your traditional uh, clothes, sorry, very impressed me. And I really bought lots of the fabric from the India. So I hope uh, these difficult days uh, goes very quickly and we uh, see each other face to face again. Okay, let's start with the all selected cases. Uh, actually, to understand the histogenesis of the odontogenic tumors, we have to uh, have the knowledge of the process of tooth development is mandatory. You can see here. This picture from the uh, 1940, and we all we again use the same uh, developing stage, and that's the very important stage for the understand the odontogenic tumor. I don't want to uh, take your most of the time for the odontogenesis, we can discuss odontogenesis at least one hour, but I just want to start with the, the first three phases, especially the in initiation phase. That's very important because the, uh, the, you can see here the oral epithelium, then this, this goes to the dental lamina formation. And especially uh, certain areas of basal cells of the ectoderm proliferate more rapidly than cells of agents area. And this leads to the formation of dental lamina, which is a band of epithelium that is invading underlying and ectomezyncum along each of the horseshoe shaped feature dental arc. You can see here, this, this is the old first stage. The second one's the proliferation stage. At this stage, there is no histo differentiation or morphe differentiation. Cells are rarely proliferative, and there is condensation of ectomazanchyme cells, which also proliferate without differentiation. And at the third stage, we can call this bell stage, and um, that time in this stage, morphogenesis of tooth begins and continues till heart tissue uh, formation begins. And especially histodifferentiation is also begins at, at this uh, stage. And most of the odontogenic tumors just uh, fall off the, this stage of odontogenesis. So uh, it's very important to, to know the, how the odontogenesis happens during the embryonic time. 
So at the origin of the odontogenic tumors, we have some remnants of the odontogenic uh, tissues. Uh, we know that the serous is very important remnants of the dental lamina parts, reduced dental epithelium and malice epithelial rest of the malice, uh, malices. These are the very certain origin of the odontogenic tumors. But also we know that odontogenic cyst lying to germ and basal cell of oral epithelium, also very important sources of the odontogenic tumors. Uh, of course, uh, making a diagnosis, uh, it's uh, with these three uh, features to evaluate with these three features, clinical features, radiological features, and histopathological features together. And sometimes history is almost everything. As all, all bone pathology, especially the jaw lesions, and needs the really good radiographic examination. Uh, if you have a time to see the or, uh, pat uh, pathologic slides in the path presenter, the whole slide imaging, I know you have no history of the patient's uh, cases and no radiologic uh, features, but just we want to make you a brainstorm to make the diagnosis uh, to know nothing. But I know uh, that's not fair. So today we are going to discuss very deeply with these histopathology slides with the clinical features and also radiological features. Uh, just I, before the cases, I just want to show you something. I, I know most of you maybe know that. The, you can see mandibular color here and here. If you see any radiolicency below this mandibular canal, it is unlikely to be origin from odontogenic tissues. So please be careful when you're evaluating the uh, radiolicent lesion or radiopath lesions. If it is under the, this mandibular canal or uh, below or uh, upper of them. If you see any under uh, radiolicency like here, oops, sorry, here, here, uh, at that time, uh, it's unlikely to be or, uh, originate from the odontogenic, uh, odontogenic tissues. So you have to, or you uh, need to see that these radiolicents or radiolicent retrofect lesions uh, just uh, here or here and other tooth bearing areas. That's a, a, a small clue for uh, to your approach to uh, panoramic um, radio, radiographies. Okay, let's start with the case one. Uh, as you know that the odontogenic tumors usually occur in the uh, jaw, but sometimes we can see on the mucosal sites, peripheral, we can call this a peripheral odontogenic uh, tumors. Uh, this is the only case in this um, odontogenic tumor series is from soft tissue. Uh, 31 years old female patients and nodular lesion on the gingiva between her lower right premolars. Yes, uh, this is a very good chance to see the whole slide together uh, in the path presenter uh, platform. You can see here the very nice uh, epithelium, surface epithelium. Uh, under the surface epithelium, a little bit the free zone here. After that, the very big, large muscles you can see here. When we look at it closely, I just uh, prepared some annotations to uh, to not to make time consuming with you. Uh, so when you see this such a amyloblastic epithelial islands, how can we understand this amyloblastic? Uh, we can see the palisading basal layer you can see here the, with, the, with the reverse polarity and the, these cells also resembling satellite reticulum like. And also we can see a pink as unstructured material here. We call this the dentinoid or in other site you can see the dentinoid. Dentinoid material sometimes confused with the other osteoid material but when you see the uh, especially uh, the odontogenic epithelium, near the odontogenic epithelium, it is more likely the dentinoids other than other heart tissues. And what we have now, amyloblastic epithelium, dentinoid material, and also a very specific ghost cells you can see here. And in the odontogenic tumor, we have three distinct ghost cells 
uh, lesions. One is calcifying odontogenesis, other dentinogenic ghost cell tumor, and dentino, uh, ghost uh, uh, odontogenic carcinoma. We have three distinct. And for the soft tissue, especially, it's quite rare. But when we think that the, these features and the, this, the soft tissue at that time or diagnosis should be peripheral odontogenic ghost cell tumor. The main differences between the dentinogenic ghost cell tumor and calcifying odontogenic cysts, uh, the calcifying odontogenic cysts almost always completely uh, um, contain the large cystic areas, but dentinogenic ones maybe includes a small cyst, but usually solid ones. And the peripheral uh, odontogenic tumor is quite rare. Uh, and uh, this dentinogenic ghost cell tumor shares same histopathological feature as their intraosseous uh, counterpart. And conservative excision is an appreciate treatment and rare recurrence after the complete uh, in, uh, excision. So when we look at closely extraosseous odontogenic tumor, I think most of you uh, come across with the odontogenic fibroma, which is very common uh, when compared with the other uh, extraosseous odontogenic tumor. But time to time, we can see amyloblastoma, calcifying epithelial odontogenic tumor, as for uh, example, dentogenic cell tumors. And also, squamous odontogenic tumor and adenomatite odontogenic tumor also uh, reported in the literature as a peripheral type. Okay, now we are uh, start to do uh, jaw lesions, uh, jaw odontogenic uh, tumors with uh, case two. 34 years old male patients, it's the incidental finding in the radiographic examination. Uh, you can see radiology here. Uh, it's a radiolucent lesion uh, and relatively a uh, well defined uh, lesion at the samples of the mandible. Uh, this is one of the, my favorite uh, diagnoses for the odontogenic uh, tumors because uh, we have to know that this entity and we have to be very careful to evaluate the cystic lesions. Uh, so I usually prefer to submit the whole tissue for the cystic lesions. If you just see such a areas, I'm sure you have no idea what is this. Maybe dentigerous cyst here, maybe other cysts. There is no special uh, things uh, if you cut uh, just here, if you see just uh, this side. So very careful examination need for the diagnosis of the, this unique odontogen, cystic odontogenic tumor. So again, I just want to uh, open my uh, annotations here to see the uh, nice one. Maybe you know that the, I don't know if you use the red, white, blue effect. When you see here a uh, red, white and blue effect, please be careful to look at the, these cells very carefully and at the high power, what are their uh, features. Uh, this is a very nice example. When you look at the uh, even low power, uh, such appearance uh, should to be uh, take into your mind the diagnosis of unicystic amyloblastoma. Uh, and if you are lucky, yes, th these are a very characteristic the areas and the, uh, the reverse polarity cells uh, at the basal layer. And sometimes we can see very nice satellite reticulum cells, but sometimes we don't. So we have to be careful. If we are lucky, we have just case this the nice amyloblastic epithelial like islands here and here that time it's very uh, it, it's more easier to make this the amyloblastic epithelium and to give the correct diagnosis so unicystic amyloblast i just want to say a few words for the uh, unicystic amyloblastoma treatment because it's a very uh, controversial so just i want to open here and the, we have to write the type of so uni, unicystic amyloblastoma in our report. Because today we know that the luminal or intraluminal unicystic amyloblastoma need basic enucleation for their treatment. But today we know that the especially mural type unicystic amyloblastoma uh, 
can uh, behavior like the conventional amyloblastoma. So sometimes they need the excision or resection. So the last WHO classification just say that the uh, I will say this, but before that, the, uh, when we look at the basic uh, features of the unicystic amyloblastoma, it approximately occur 5 to 22 percent of all amyloblastomas. And when we look at the age distribution, especially if associated with the impacted tooth, uh, 63 years old for the, uh, this case, and the, in the absence of the impaction, 35 uh, years old for these uh, lesions. A slight male uh, predominance for this uh, lesion and most often located in the mandibular tortmolar area uh, followed by the body and symphysis and for the maxillary lesions uh, especially they tend to occur in the posterior areas. When we go back to the treatment of the unicystic amyloblastoma, uh, it's radiographically mimicked the cystic lesions. So usually clinicians just make the initial treatment often consist of an equation. And these uh, lesions um, usually uh, take their, the correct diagnosis after histopathologic examination. So further treatment is determined by the pattern and extent of the amyloblastomatous proliferation, which I say the especially the moral type. So the last double UHO classification just recommended that a moral type case should be treated as a conventional amyloblastoma when it recurs. The next classification, what we'll say we will uh, see together, maybe a professor uh, Tlekaradnes uh, gives some uh, clue for this. Okay, case three. Uh, 70 years old female patients, uh, the patient has a swelling and uh, multilocular radiolucency involving the posterior mandible. You can see, I, I, I'm sure most of uh, you know, uh, similar with the, familiar with the, this appearance, the uh, bubble appearance, you can see a very, uh, again, just I want to show that this uh, mandibular canal, you can see the a uh, tumor just push it, but never below the, this mandibular canal. You can see here uh, very nicely. So this the multilocular uh, honey bubble uh, appearance. Uh, we all know that especially we have to think that the, the first uh, differential diagnosis, of course, is amyloblastoma. Yes, uh, when we look at the, uh, these nice, uh, pretty uh, histopathologic features, I'm sure this is a straightforward case. Uh, and of course, most of the uh, authors like to use the weaker Gorlin criteria. What are they? The hyperchromatism of the epithelial basal layer, basal cell nuclear, you can see here, uh, palisading and polarization of the basal cell nuclear away from the uh, basement membrane, you can see, and a vocalization of the basal layer, you can see uh, very nicely. All these, the, these features are very important for the to uh, define the amyloblastic epithelium. Yes, uh, we have most of the type of uh, histopathologic type of the uh, amyloblastum, even in one lesion, you can see here the a follicular type here and at some small island, there is no connection between them or plexiform type you can see they are uh, made uh, anastomizing between uh, the island and sometimes we can see squamous metaplasia or sometimes we can call the acantomatous uh, amyloblastoma. We can see all this histopathologic typing uh, in one lesion. Uh, one study just showed that the according to this histopathologic type, if, there, if you ask me if there are any recurrence differences between them, one study just showed that the plexiform and follicular type uh, show the more recurrence than the others. Maybe it's about the uh, follicular and plexiform uh, types is the most common types. Maybe because of that, they, their recurrence rate is, uh, is higher than the others. Uh, maybe because of this, because we know that the amyloblastome has the uh, higher recurrence if they not uh, have the upper rate. 
So, uh, when we look at the amyloblastoma, uh, if we exclude odontomas, the most common odontogenic tumors, and the, the range, uh, uh, age range between the 8 to 30, uh, 92 years and no sex predilection, approximately 80% of the all amyloblastoma cases are on the mandible at the posterior regions, followed by the anterior mandible posterior maxillary and anterior maxillary site. This site is very important to approach to our uh, the, the distinct uh, diagnosis to make it. That's very important. Only desmoplastic amyloblastoma makes some differences from the other amyloblastoma types. The anterior region of the both jaws, especially the maxillary site, uh, they like to occur. Uh, and especially in radiological features, uh, Fibroosseous lesions, they look like the fibroosseous lesions. The amyloblastic amyloblastoma really have the different uh, clinical and radiological features. And, but at the last WH classification, again, uh, the desmoplastic amyloblastoma is not a, a distinct entity from the other conventional amyloblastoma. And the, when we look at the treatment choice, white surgical excision with 1.5 surgeon free margins, that's uh, the very important for uh, the not the recurrence. And the conservative surgery really associated with the high recurrence rate. Uh, the case for, I think, the most difficult case uh, during the, this uh, odontogenic tumor series, I'm really wondering about what do you think about these cases. Uh, 31 years old male patients, asymptomatic patients, right sent lesion of the right posterior mandible ramus. Again, you can see radiological features here. Again, here the, our mandibular canal. And you can see a very corticated mass. Uh, it seems that it's a very slow growing. And uh, radial sense, unilocular uh, radial sent lesions. Uh, yes, yeah, it looks like the maybe odontogenic origin. Uh, when we look at here, yeah, very closely. I haven't got any annotation here. Uh, you can see as such the double uh, layer of the uh, cells. Uh, most of the areas are very similar to each other. Yes, you can see uh, the, uh, some vocalizations also see uh, on some uh, areas of the cytoplasm. Uh, just I want to show you here. Uh, maybe here you can get some clues. Uh, this is the first case I just learned that the, this type of the, uh, tumors also show in odontogenic lesions. Maybe you know that. Uh, so I want to share my experience with this lesion. You can see the, all, of the, uh, all of the whole slides show the same appearance, the double layer. And uh, some areas I couldn't find here. Maybe uh, you can get the clue what it's this. And one of the, my uh, general pathology colleagues just called this, please be careful that, why didn't it think that the adeno, uh, adenocarcinoma? Oh, I said, no, with this radiology, it's impossible. To, uh, it's, it could be a carcinoma. But if you are unaware of with these uh, features, yes, it's possible to think that uh, adenocarcinoma, but it's not, of course. Yeah, so I just want to continue, then go back maybe at the discussion. This is again amyloblastoma cases. Yes, I spent approximately two weeks with this case. And uh, um, I just say that the three different patterns of the plexiform amyloblastoma. And we all know that the classical variant just showed you. And this one, uh, dental lamellar pattern, but still plexiform, uh, occurs mostly in the posterior maxilla, especially uh, I just uh, sent these cases to uh, Professor John White to take uh, his opinion and he <laughs> explained me to, me to me the dental lamellar-like pattern is also a uh, very uh, important uh, pattern of the amyloblastoma to know to make the overdiagnosis. So sometimes CK19 might be useful, uh, useful as evidence of at least odontogenic origin to exclude from the other, odont uh, other uh, epithelial uh, lesions. So uh, maybe you can use uh, this one. This is very important um, 
uh, important cases in my uh, odontogenic tumor life. Uh, okay, case five. Uh, 55, uh, 15 years old uh, female patients, asymptomatic patients, an impacted tooth in the maxillary surrounded by a well dedicated predominantly rodent lesions. Lesion. You can see here, yes, we have an embedded tooth here, and around uh, the, this scroll, you can see very well uh, corticated, very well uh, uh, well defined uh, radiolysancy with some small opposite just. Uh, just uh, near the uh, impacted crown. I'm sure uh, the differential diagnosis uh, come to your mind. Uh, and when we look at the uh, histopathology, this is a very classical. I think the most classic, uh, the, the most unique uh, odontogenic uh, tumor histopathology. Uh, it's very clear. What is this? Yes, you can see whoops, a duplex structure here. That's the, uh, the most important one and the very uh, thick capsule around here. Uh, and sometimes this look like structure, oops, uh, with a central lumen inside it. Sometimes we can see solid aggregates of cells with a central pore-like structure. And sometimes we can see this, uh, areas contain amyloid-like material. So I'm sure this is again straightforward cases for you. And you can see a very nice, uh, again, uh, adonate-like appearance here and solid aggregates. I can't see any amyloid-like material here, but sometimes we can see the classification again inside the uh, adenomatoid odontogenic tumor. So this is a very classical example of the uh, adenomatoid odontogenic tumor. So uh, it occurs, it's rare and uh, approximately 5% of all odontogenic tumors. Uh, Enucleation is the treatment of the choice and recurrence due to the incomplete excision uh, can be seen. Uh, and the, another uh, discussion for the adenomatoid odontogenic tumor, are there really tumor or just the hamartomatous lesion? That's the, another uh, challenging topic in odontogenic tumor. Uh, I like this. This is from the uh, Practical Head and Neck Pathology Frequently Asked Question book, uh, which was published in uh, 2019. Two thirds rule, uh, many times it's so true. Uh, for the adenomatoid odontogenic tumor, two thirds occur in females in the maxillary site associated with an impacted tooth. And uh, the impacted tooth usually are canines and the, the radiograph show uh, radio opaque flags of classification, as I just showed you. Case six, uh, 90, uh, 29 years old female patient, an expensive mixed radiolicent radio population in the posterior maxillary site. Yes, you can see here uh, and relatively uh, well defined. Uh, we cannot say that so much defined, but relatively well, well defined. Uh, right, the sense maybe radio opacity, and here again the one uh, embedded tooth here. Uh, okay, when we look at this, is the uh, Keith Hunter. I think just I want to say that uh, Keith really likes this uh, odontogenic tumor. And when we look at the this, uh, almost all the whole slides have this such uh, appearance. Uh, polyhedral architectures, whoops, uh, with the hyperchromatism here and enlarge the nuclear uh, conveying. Pseudo atypical morphology. This is the when we see if you don't know that this entity, when you see that these epithelial uh, cells, it's um, very easy to say that these are atypic, atypic uh, epithelial cells. So that's uh, that's the uh, very unique lesion for the uh, jaw. When you see this pseudo atypical uh, epithelial cells, just you have to remember these lesions. Another one that uh, you can see is like classification, the ring-like concentric basophilic uh, classification you can see. That's also very unique to these lesions. 
and of course the uh, amyloid uh, like material now you know that the, we uh, say that the odom odontogenic amyloblast associated protein which is is also a uh, congruent positive uh, material you can see here so i think with this uh, uh, with these features, uh, I'm sure uh, you get the, the correct answer and classifying epithelial odontogenic tumor. It's extremely rare and uh, approximately 1% uh, of the, all uh, odontogenic tumors. No gender predilection. Uh, it can be seen at any age, uh, but the uh, predilection for the third to sixth decade of life and the mean age is 40 years old. A uh, demandable is affected twice as often as the maxillary site, and uh, local surgical removal with uh, for free margin is very important because we know that the recurrence rate is uh, fifteen percent uh, due to the incomplete surgery, uh, surgical excision. Uh, case seven, uh, thirty-nine years old male patients with mild swelling. Mixed radiocent radiopac lesion in the anterior maxillary site, and a clinical diagnosis was amyloblastic odontoma. Uh, again, you can see here one embedded tooth here and the uh, well defined uh, radiocent lesion you can see here, and also uh, some uh, radio opacity inside it. You can see a very nice, uh, again, a, another a, a BT. A, appearance with these lesions. Yes, what we have now, uh, again, we have a very thick capsule here, and just we have calcifications, large calcification areas, the, with the inside the very desmoplastic uh, stroma, and we have the capsule. There is nothing uh, except the calcification and this capsule. All this is uh, areas included the large classification areas. We have one more slide, one more whole slide imaging for this case here. If you catch the some areas, I just want to show you again. We have the uh, large classification areas inside the lesions, but maybe you can catch the, these polyhedral cells and the ring classification, and we can call these the classifying epithelial odontogenic tumor-like areas you can see here. Also, we have some clear cells, which also uh, uh, we can time, uh, time see the clear cells in the uh, classify, classifying epithelial odontogenic tumor. But when we look at the closely, closely and carefully, we can just see the some duck-like structure. And especially here, we have lots of the duck-like uh, structure when we look at the very careful, the whole slides and adenomatoid odontogenic like areas we can see. Uh, so is it the classifying epithelial odontogenic tumor or uh, adenomatoid odontogenic tumor? Okay, look at the, the uh, what's the last WHO classification say. Uh, adenomatoid odontogenic tumor and adenomatoid odontogenic tumor like areas have been recognized with other odontogenic tumor. We all know that. And the more than uh, 25 cases of uh, these lesions have been reported together with. Some authors recommend the uh, designation of the combined epithelial odontogenic tumor. Some of them uh, just called the hybrid odontogenic tumors. But the, the current consensus is that the uh, cells like areas, classifying epithelial odontogenic tumor like areas, are simply part of the histological spectrum of adenomatoid odontogenic tumor. So we just call these cases as adenomatoid odontogenic tumor. Uh, case eight. Uh, 90, 29 years old male patients and buccal and lingual expansion of the mandible, pain is similar to toothache. This is again one of the, my favorite uh, odontogenic tumor because the radiologically is, is uh, diagnostic. You can see here the uh, very nice uh, radio opacity foods with the uh, tooth root of the tooth 
uh, this is very a uh, classical uh, appearance of the this uh, unique lesion. Most of the radiology uh, radiologues uh, just give the uh, definitive uh, diagnosis with this appearance. I'm sure you also get what is this. Okay. Uh, yes, this is the very uh, heart tissue. Okay. Uh, this is all areas almost the same and we can see this semantum like uh, tissue with especially prominent uh, rest and reversal lines maybe here yes you can see here prominent uh, this lying that's very important clue again oops okay uh, so uh, also the plump active looking semantoblast rim the trabecule you can see here sometimes we can see the uh, the giant cells sometimes uh, some authors call that the semantoclast i like to use the semantoclast for these lesions here 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 and this plump the active osteo uh, semantoblast is very important clue for the diagnosis again so when we look at the, this side it seems very active bone active heart tissue and also active cells so we have to be careful with the differential diagnosis so the radiology is so important otherwise if you uh, come across with this appearance lots of the differential diagnosis come to in your mind especially osteoblastoma but with that radiology it's impossible to make the, this uh, appearance with the uh, osteoblastoma so that's very important uh, as we know that all bone pathology uh, evaluated with the radiography features together of course the clinical features so our uh, uh, diagnosis would be semantoblastoma uh, and it occurs one to six percent of all odontogenic tumor uh, patient ra age range is uh, the large and the mean uh, 20 years and uh, no distinct predilection for gender and the characteristic features in pain is also especially the toothache and the old patients just described their pain like toothache that's the very important clinical uh, feature for our diagnosis and also the radiographic appearance as i said is characteristic and almost pathognomonic that's very important so uh, if you just we look at the histopathological features it's really difficult to get the correct diagnosis uh, between the osteoblastoma especially and semantoblastoma uh, and the treatment is the conservative treatment is the uh, modality of the uh, treatment and um, we can see recurrence due to the incomplete removal especially the tooth also extracted uh, to uh, avoid the recurrence so uh, significant resemblance to osteoblastoma, as I said, but osteoblastoma do not originate from the surface of the roots and do not adhere to it. That's the very important clue uh, to uh, differentiate between two lesions uh, with the clinical and radiological features. As I said, it's impossible only with the histopathological features. Case 9. 45 years old female patients and the patient has the pain, ulceration and swelling. Uh, Radiocent lesion with irregular borders in the posterior mandible ramus. Uh, you can see a uh, very bad uh, ill-defined radiolicency here and maybe just go there and also uh, I'm not sure if you see or not the soft tissue uh, swelling you can see here and the, also the uh, soft tissue mass uh, the patient had. Okay, so uh, what we have here, yeah, yes, we have the keratinized tissue here. When we look at here, uh, yes, maybe at first glance, maybe we, we are looking at a, a keratinized a odontogenic cyst here. Uh, very nice areas we have also. Oops, just I want to. Open here. Yes, again, you can see a very nice cyst lying, uh, but under the this, you can see some small islands here. And this again, here, uh, again, we have the keratinizing lying epithelium. Yes, it seems that the, uh, the precursor is uh, orthokeratinized or prekeratinized odontogenic cyst. We don't know, maybe it's orthokeratinized odontogenic cyst 
maybe and also uh, odontogenic keratosis. And sometimes we can see abundant keratinization here and we see lost of the smallness of islands of atypical uh, spinal cells you can see here, here lost of the areas again here, here, here. And these uh, atypical squamous cells. Uh, so we know that we are looking for the uh, uh, carc squamous carcinoma. So it's most likely uh, originated from the some keratinized odontogenic cysts. Most of the areas include the, uh, some uh, atypical squamous epithelium. So or diagnosis would be primary intraosseous carcinoma. Sometimes it's very difficult to say that it's primary or metastatic, but this time you will see the precursor of the, uh, the originate odontogenic lying. So uh, we can call this primary, but otherwise if we um, wouldn't see the, any cystic-like appearance at that time, we have to exclude uh, especially metastatic uh, lesion or invading of the soft tissue uh, oral squamous carcinoma, uh, we have to exclude all of them, then say uh, primary introsis carcinoma. It is a wide range and uh, uh, age range with a mean age at the diagnosis of 60, uh, frequently in the corpus and posterior region of the mandible. Uh, maxillary cases like to occur uh, in the anterior region. And the uh, treatment, of course, radical resection with the uh, selective next uh, dissection. Unfortunately, we know that the prognosis is poor. Yes, as I said that the, uh, this is also diagnosis of ex exclusion. Uh, we have to know the histopathological, radiological and clinical information need to exclude metastasis, malignant odontogenic tumors of specific types, Carcinomas of the maxillary antrum, especially it occurs maxillary sites, it's uh, more complex to say that it's primary introsteus odontogenic carcinoma. And introsteus salivary gland neoplasm, all these are uh, excreted. But for my cases, uh, we were lucky to see the odontogenic cis lying to say that it's a primary. So, uh, CK19, again, I say that negative is staining indicates that an or, uh, odontogenic epithelium origin is unlikely. Uh, I really want to hear your um, uh, experience with this CK19 uh, for the, to show the odontogenic origin. Okay, uh, almost we finished the all cases. Case 10, uh, 55 years old male patients. Uh, the patient says the pain swelling and the radiolucent lesion. Here, uh, that's the uh, very uh, long history of the patients. This is the uh, 2012 uh, radiography. You can see here the uh, relatively uh, ill-defined radiolucency here and also a uh, root reduction uh, here. You can see resorption. So when we look at, you haven't got this whole slide imaging, you had the last, uh, uh, last, um, last um, tissue of the patients. This is from the 2012. And we can, we all know that the, yes, this epithelial island uh, cleared the faintly eosinophilic cytoplasm, well demarcated cell membrane, you can see irregular small dike staining nuclear cells, densely sclerotic stroma, uh, and it just uh, looks like the uh, clear cell uh, odontogenic carcinoma, but we know that the all clear cell carcinomas need again excluded uh, exclusion of the diagnosis. So this is the uh, 2012, uh, this is the consultation case uh, for me. Yes, again, another uh, site, you can see a very nice clear cells just with the surrounding with the dark cells island and the very desmoplastic stroma around to these islands. Yes, this is the from uh, the neck uh, last year uh, appearance. Uh, sorry, not last year. Uh, after this, uh, the uh, patient get the uh, diagnosis of the just the unspecified carcinoma. And uh, on the other uh, center, just make this uh, 
operation. After two years, there is no uh, recurrence here, and you can see the, uh, the healing process. But after uh, uh, approximately seven years, we can see again some radiolysis, some uh, again uh, nux, uh, uh, recurrence uh, lesions here. And I saw this uh, tissue. And this is the whole slide imaging, which you also evaluated. You can see the almost the same appearance with the uh, 2012. Just I want to show you this, the same cells. Uh, yes, uh, fairly eosinophilic. Some are areas. Some areas. Okay, just I want to show. Okay. Just I want to show you here. This is the salivary gland tissue. So. If we don't know the previous uh, radiography here, just I want to go back, sorry. If we don't know that this, the, uh, this uh, very uh, close, uh, inside the jawbone and very close to, uh, tooth, at that time we can usually call this the clear cell uh, carcinoma of the uh, salivary gland. They're almost the same feature with the histopathologic list. So the clinical and the radiographic examination is so important for that. If you just see these areas and if you just see such an appearance, so it's really difficult to uh, make the differential diagnosis if it's the salivary gland origin or odontogenic origin. This is also a very challenging case, I know. So we know that the uh, odontogenic clear cell carcinoma is quite rare. Uh, and more common in female, and the main uh, patient age uh, 53 years old. Uh, mandible is affected uh, three times uh, more uh, than the maxillar side. Uh, we know that the, uh, the treatment choice is the, of course, surgical resection and radiotherapy may also be considered according to, uh, it depends on the case. Uh, the outcome has been that in 50, percent of the cases and the median survival 14 years. A recurrence and metastasis may develop after many years. Uh, differential diagnosis is important for such a clear cell lesions. Yes, we know that the feature is distinctive but not pathognomonic, especially exclusion of other clear cell rich neoplasts, uh, especially for the slavery gl uh, gland neoplasts, important to observe mucin with DPAS or DPAS stain. And to exclude melanoma, uh, every time melanoma uh, should be in our mind for the uh, such cases and the, uh, some special staining for the melanoma should be uh, negative. And the metastatic renal cell carcinoma is also very important differential diagnosis. So uh, I really like to use the PIX8 uh, to exclude the metastatic renal cell carcinoma other than the CD10. Also, we have to be very careful with the amyloblastoma with clear cell differentiation and also clear cell classifying epithelial odontogenic tumor. Uh, but we have to uh, keep in your mind that the clear cell changes in, the, in these lesions is usually focal. So that's the important clue to uh, differentiate it from the true uh, clear cell odontogenic carcinoma. Uh, case 11, uh, 61 years old female patient, male patients, trismus, pain and swelling at the patient's symptoms large right descent lesion of the posterior mandible with soft tissue extension. Yes, you can see, and the clinician also make the incisional biopsy very difficultly because of the trismus. And you can see a very large destructive lesions here uh, and also here the destructive. And you can also see the uh, soft tissue extension from these panoramic features. Also, I have these the uh, BT uh, features. Uh, yes, you can see both uh, one uh, has the, uh, the destruction with the tumor and the very large mass uh, extended to the soft tissue. Yes, we know that we are looking for the, uh, the malignant tumor. So, uh, yes, as I said, the, from the uh, trismus, just we made, uh, it's impossible to take the, any part in the uh, jaw. So just uh, the clinician uh, performed the biopsy from the soft tissue. Uh, so you can see the uh, surface epithelium here. 
when we look at the under the surface epithelium, you can see a cytological features of malignancy. You can see it. And his uh, pathological pattern of ameloblastoma. I will show the uh, more uh, good areas for the ameloblastic differentiation. But when we look at here, we can see just a typical malignant of epithelial uh, tumor. Yes, uh, you can see a marked uniform TPA and peripheral basal layer of the palisading cells with the reverse polarity. Yes, lots of the bizarre, bizarre cells you can see here, both in stroma and also the uh, tumor islands. Yes, again, another one here. Uh, but we also catch this, some ameloblastic features in some areas. So if we catch these ameloblastic features with these malignant uh, features, our diagnosis uh, many times uh, easy. But if we uh, don't see any ameloblastic differentiation so well, at that time, the other carcinomes, uh, of course, uh, should be in our differential diagnosis. For this case, yes, we have the ameloblastic island with the malignant features. And, but look at the stromal cells also. You can see some uh, bizarre stromal cells, some spindle cells, uh, some uh, uh, really uh, not uh, the, looks like so much epitoloid, some sarcomatoid appearance. At the time, how do we call these uh, lesions? It is true odontogenic carcinosarcoma or just it is uh, ameloblastic uh, carcinoma. So, when we look at the or uh, UH classification, they made a comment for this. Uh, we will discuss later. Uh, and the ameloblastic carcinoma, uh, the main age is 50, and the posterior mandible uh, is the most common site. Of course, swelling, pain, ulceration, and other malignant symptoms uh, can be seen. The main treatment is radical surgical resection, and we know that the prognosis is unfortunately quite poor. Uh, lung metastasis develops much more commonly than the local regional lymph node metastasis for the ameloblastic carcinoma, and uh, especially recurrence uh, also with a high, uh, although we make the resection. So just I want to show do you do uh, what says the WH code classification for these uh, stromal cells. Uh, ameloblastic stroma associated with malignant spindle cell proliferation the, is best characterized as sarcomatoid ameloblastic carcinoma rather than true odontogenic carcinosarcoma. So we call this, uh, this is also from my cases. So we call these um, cases as uh, sarcomatoid ameloblastic carcinoma. Uh, so this is another very uh, controversial, challenging case for the uh, odontogenic tumors. So uh, I just want to thank the pet presenter to make this presentation such a full slide imaging, such a multi-head microscopic examination. And thank you for all you uh, who are listening to us and thanks for your kind attention. I'm happy to take any question, but now I just want to leave the words Dr. Mandana and Dr. Rago. Thank you, Dr. Marwa, for that uh, very <clears throat> insightful lecture. Uh, you made the lecture very interesting, interactive, and uh, some of the slides and some of the cases uh, that you showed was really a treat to the eyes. Uh, uh, Dr. Jose Hill has a question. Uh, over to you, Jose. Yes, I do have yeah. a question. Uh, Meva, you know, wonderful cases. I really love the industry. I've got a couple of things that I would like to discuss with you. Actually, the number one is the issue of the AOT and the COT. Do you think that the a AOT is, uh, as you already mentioned, a, a true tumor? And if it's not, why would it be COT differentiation or COET association? Because that we regard as a tumor. Okay, for me it's a tumor, but some I know some authors think that it is the hamartomatous lesion. But in more opinion and with the clinical and the radiological features, I think it's the, one of the or uh, pretty good uh, odontogenic tumor. What's your opinion? Do you think that it's a tumor? 
you know, we did a study here <clears throat> where we compared the CHI-67 labeling index of AOT with the digit cysts and uh, myoblastomas, and we found that all of three, the adenomatoid odontic tumor had the lowest KI-67 index, which is very interesting. <clears throat> so the question is that, uh, is this actually a hematoma or not? Or is it the hematoma in your case with maybe tumor differentiation? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm really... I'm really in, in two two folders to say, well, what is this? Is this a, a hybrid hybrid hematoma with a autogenic tumor, or is the autogenic tumor arising in the hematoma, or are they just collision tumors, or both tumors? The difference. In, I don't think we've actually gone to the end uh, of all of it. That's my opinion. Yeah, yeah, I think we need more molecular uh, because the odontogenesis uh, now today we know that most of the molecular different molecular pathway just uh, try to absorb in the uh, odontogenesis. Maybe the molecular studies uh, show that if they are a different pathway or just the uh, hematomatocytes, we will see. Uh, the other question that I have for you as, as command is that you know the, either the second last case show these uh, clear cells in that. Um, and, but it was quite a cellular stroma surrounding him. Did the uh, diagnosis of odontogenic fibroma if you cross your mind? Uh, odontogenic fibroma with this, uh, yes, of course, uh, odontogenic fibroma is also uh, the differential diagnosis. With the, these radiographic features, with the, these uh, malignant features, uh, especially the second one, uh, the no, I don't think so. It's the uh, quite uh, benign lesions. Uh, also, uh, the uh, odontogenic fibroma, yes, we have some clear cells, but the islands is not so distinctive with the dark small cells around surrounding it. But of course, with the clinical and the radiological features and histopathologic features, I think uh, the, uh, I, don't, I, I didn't think that the odontogenic fibroma. And I agree with you. It's just <clears throat> historically, I think, uh... One has to be careful. You've got to look at the stroma as well, because they can have various cellularity, both from the epithelial side as well from the stromal side. And I've seen extreme examples of, of both. So, um, okay. but they would have calcifications, and that is one of the things that this one didn't have. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Josh. Uh, yeah, uh, very good uh, presentation, Dr. Marwa, and uh, the photomicrographs are very excellent. Um, I have a query. The um, case four you have presented as a variant of plexiform amyloblastoma. So uh, I feel that in literature uh, that has been described as atypical amyloblastoma. Is it one and the same? Uh, actually, this is a very uh, good question, and uh, the dental laminal like uh, amyloblastoma. Uh, for this case, I just forget to say that after th th that was the in incisional biopsy. After that, we had the uh, whole inflation. We see very nice amyloblastic, uh, the classical plexiform sites. So that's very uh, important that I want to show you. If we see just like areas, yes, sometimes called atypical amyloblastoma or other. Uh, uh, terminology they also give, but we have to know that the plexiform sometimes shows such appearance. So uh, I think, uh, yes, um, that's the first case, uh, the only case I see such a uh, dental laminal like uh, areas. Uh, uh, yes, I think all of them the same spectrum, uh, but we have to be very careful if we just see such uh, appearance, especially it's very important to distinguish with, between the other uh, uh, over diagnosis. Yeah, thank you, doctor. Welcome. Uh, but there are a couple of questions uh, in the chat box, and one is from uh, Dr. Nandini. Dr. Marwa, can you share your opinion on amyloblastic fibroodontoma and complex odontoma? Uh, are you really afraid to, uh, before the presentation? Are you really afraid to ask such a question? <laughs> because you know that the um, amyloblastic fibrodontoma, fibrodontoma, the, the very, very big challenge, maybe the big challenging topic in the odontogenic tumor. Uh, I think that, yes, uh, we haven't got any um, distinct molecular. Uh, 
evidence, but I think that the ameloblastic fibrodontoma is um, really different and distinct odontogenic tumor and complex odontoma is different. Yes, sometimes it's really difficult to make the uh, differential diagnosis just based on the histopathological features, but we have to be very careful with the, uh, the clinical pictures and some, also we have some clue for the histopathological features. Uh, so uh, it should be another uh, lecture topic, but uh, uh, in my opinion, they are different uh, tumors. Thank you, Marwa. Do we have any more questions from the audience? I think now we have Marwa coming back for one more lecture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. After the IOP debate. <laughs> Well, I just have uh, one question. See, in the 2017 classification under the malignant odontogenic tumors, uh, we have odontogenic carcinosarcoma added as a new entity. And also we have odontogenic sarcomas. Is there uh, a need to do the hair splitting here? And how many cases do we have to uh, call one as an uh, isolated entity of odontogenic carcinoma and how different it could be from the odontogenic carcinosarcoma. Yeah, that's a, again a very good question. We have only one odontogenic carcinoma in my department. Odontog uh, carcinosarcoma, sorry, odontogenic carcinosarcoma. Yes, we have uh, especially the uh, amyloblastic carcinoma. Yes, the uh, the also uh, amyloblastic fibrosarcoma, we have, I think, uh, 10. But for the carcinosarcoma, I think it's a very uh, difficult diagnosis to make it. Especially uh, when we look at the uh, epithelial island and stroma, both should be malignant. But it's really difficult sometimes uh, to call it as, as my cases. It's both epithelial sites is really have the distinct malignant criteria. The stroma cells also a little bit sarcomatate. It, it, it's a very challenging topic again, but I have only one case C in my experience, uh, carcinosarcoma. Do you have more? No. Uh, the, uh, the, let, let me just give a comment. Because the, this is a good question Raghu asked. Yes, odontogenic carcinosarcoma. We had a lot of discussions even this time uh, for the upcoming WHO book whether to leave it or take it out. Because as Mava correctly said, it's exceptionally rare if it exists. Uh, but uh, without going into a controversy, we left it as it is. But uh, <laughs> I, my gut feeling it might uh, probably disappear next time. Yeah. Uh, you know, but this time yeah. we, we have both odontogenic carcinoma sarcoma and odontogenic sarcoma, both of them. Uh, I need, I have another meeting, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, Hello. Just, yes. Yeah, just, yeah. Yes. Hi, just, just on this, I must actually give you a bit of uh, historical perspective. You know that Professor Mervyn Shear and Pinborg and Arvid Kramer, they started the classification of autogenic tumors. You yeah. know that? Yeah. And yes, they yes. did, be, and they based it on, a, on an original exchange group that, con, uh, that was him, uh, Shear, Pinborg, Kramer, and then also somebody from Chile, I think well, for our colleague from Chile. And they did circulating cases in the, in the early 60s and 70s. And those cases, I had the privilege as a, as a trainee to go through and basically got through the whole thing. They, I think, have included carcinosarcoma based also on one case that they had in their circulation. I've got the case. Wow. And uh, in my, my, um, my, my, the collection Professor Shear gave to me. Uh, but I, I, it is quite dicey to just justify a whole classification based on one case. But, you know, they were starting up and, you know, since then we've got five more, you know, fifth generation of books now. But I do know that for a fact that that case was uh, circulated, uh, discussed, and I got the original correspondence. As a matter of fact, I should document it. Nobody else has got it. Because I don't know where Pinbox cases are or uh, Kramer's cases, but I've got, I've got the collection here in Cape Town. And with the original sort of typed comments that they had by correspondence by mail and things like that, it's very historic. But there was one case. So <clears throat> I think you need to, you need to 
as I said, very carefully put it into perspective, was it really warranted to um, to call it a separate entity or was it in the, for example, a spindle cell, um, a spindle cell carcinoma, you know, um, and nowadays we actually should look perhaps a bit more closely or maybe even by electron microscopy, by, by histo uh, chemical and uh, immunized chemical analysis to see if indeed there are two separate entities or whether it's just a sarcomatory uh, differentiation of the epithelium, uh, you know, but I think it's very really dicey, as you said. It's interesting though, but it's historic. Yeah. Maybe at this point we can send out a request internationally for everyone who has the cases to collect them together and then see just how many are there. Yeah, mm. that's right. No, 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 put the information uh, out uh, there and ask. I think you will get the response there maybe one one across each continent. Um, so right now we have two. <laughs> <laughs> no, my, my gut feeling is that there is uh, an activation of the EMP program, and uh, which is perhaps the reason that you have this mesenchymal phenotype in some of these odontogenic carcinomas. But then I think in those days, perhaps we didn't have the benefit of using the immunomarkers. So, but today with some of these molecular tools that are available, we just have to confirm if these are two separate entities or there is no reason, I mean, there is no need for uh, splitting hairs. True, true, true. Yes. Any uh, more question? Uh, uh, don't see anything in the chat box. No, I think we can uh, continue to the next uh, half. And then if there are any questions that turn up, we shall uh, get back to it at the end. Thank you, Dr. Marwa, for that wonderful presentation. It's my yes, pleasure. Marwa, that was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. <laughs> yes. Now I'm going to request Dr. Yes, Ravi Kant, please uh, take over and uh, introduce our next speaker. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, madam. Uh, congratulations, madam. Uh, first of all, uh, before I start, uh, because uh, the work we have uh, done uh, over the last one year made a tremendous uh, change in the way the perception of uh, oral pathology is there in our country. So congratulations for that. It was uh, extreme uh, hard work on this area. And also, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to introduce uh, Dr. Rajendra Singh. Uh, Dr. Rajendra Singh is a professor in dermatology and uh, pathology at uh, Northwell Health, New York. He directs the dermatopathology section and is the associate chair of uh, digital pathology. He is the founder of Path Presenter, an online digital platform that has uh, over 3 lakh users in more than 180 countries. It is used by multiple academic departments, private pathology groups, and organizations all over the world. Dr. Raj has served as a chair of the American Society of Dermatopathology Informatics Committee. He currently serves on the grants committee of the American Academy of Dermatology and he's also on the editorial board of America, Journal of American Academy of Dermatology. He's the editor, creator, and developer of the app MyDermPath and educational platforms Widex.com. He also serves as a member of the editorial board of the WHO for classification of tumors, fifth edition, and on the board of Digital Pathology Association. He was nominated to the Pathologist Power List 2020 and 2021. And Dr. Raj is the recipient of the Teacher of the Year Award for consecutively for five years at Monsiani School of Medicine. And I now welcome Dr. Raj to give his uh, talk on the path presenter. Yeah, so thank you very much, Dr. Manian and uh, Dr. Manda, like Mandana for the opportunity to speak to this uh, very esteemed crowd. Uh, 
and like congratulations for like doing a wonderful job on like uh, spreading knowledge and helping the world get more access to like great speakers like marwa and like yourself from all around the world so a big congratulations to the entire team that you have that is supporting you in building this spectacular teaching platform thank you uh, i'm like, I'll, i'll just take around 10 minutes to introduce you to the platform that you can use for education and uh, spreading knowledge like mandana so let me share my screen and in 10 minutes we'll just go over the platform so that you can start using it uh, so this is the sorry okay so it's a uh, very quickly i'll give you like a very good overview so path presenter is a digital pathology platform that we created for first for ourselves and now the entire world wants to use it uh so it it provides an ecosystem that you can use for integration of whole slide images dicom images and any, any other patient data that you would like to use for clinical care education and research and the main goal was to use digital pathology to teach that was the initial uh, uh, mission statement that we started off how do we use our own slides to teach our residents and you saw like that when marwa was presenting it was almost like uh, she was sitting on a multi head scope and teaching the entire world and that is what the goal is how do you uh, use the power of digital pathology and then make it available make the the resources available to the entire world so we have multiple live platforms but the current one that uh, marwa was using is the education and the practice platform which i will very quickly give you a demo about uh, we have platforms that allow people to share data for validation of ai algorithms uh, we have a conference platform and we have a platform that pharma multiple pharma companies use for using digital pathology so you we, using path presenter you can provide resources that can be used for clinical care for education and research but today we are just going to focus on the education platform so i'm going to give you a, a very quick tour about the platform by going live and all the tools on the platform uh, currently there are multiple institutions not only in the us but also around the around the world so japan singapore australia multiple universities in the us and organizations that use the platform for education and more than 380000 users 183 countries so a lot of people are using the platform all around the world and you can see what covid did actually so when you look at covid 2020 like many people started using digital pathology to a big extent because everything had to go digital online so before 2020 we had around 500 to 1000 uh, people coming but there are days now when it crosses like 20000 so a lot of people using it around the world uh we have collaborated with the cap and the iic to produce this atlas and with the dpa to produce this academy and with the who all the blue books are now being going digital and the, the underlying software that they using is the software that runs by path presenter so there is really no excuse not to use digital pathology to learn and teach uh because you now have 35000 whole slide images which i'll currently show you how to get access to them and all the tools available on path presenter and it is like almost like the multi head scope biggest multi head scope in the world so let's go to the platform very quickly so this is the platform that you could go in so pathpresenter.net it's a free platform there is no money involved you can easily register on the platform once you register you will get access to all these tools uh the my slide box is essentially a file management system on the cloud which will allow you to upload any kind of image that you would like to use for teaching so it could be a pathology slide which is coming from any scanner it could be a radiology so any slide that is coming from like a leica scanner or a philips scanner every slide will be uploaded into the system or uh, you can also upload ct scans mri scans anything that you would like to use for radiology in your presentation so you can upload those into the system the viewers are already inbuilt or it could be a pdf document a jpeg file so whatever you need to upload mp4 files you can upload into the file management system 
Uh, once you ha have uploaded the slides, you can then also share it with the world by providing them into the slide library. So they go into the slide library after going through an editorial board. And the slide library is divided into these multiple different specialities. So when you go to oral pathology, you will find a lot of slides there that you can use for your daily teaching and education. And all these slides are available for you to just go in and look at them and then also use it for presentation and teaching. Uh, you cannot download any of the slides. All you can download is the snapshot. So nothing else can be downloaded. So you can download a snapshot. That is the only thing that can be downloaded from the platform. Uh, so you have slides in your own slide box and you have slides in the slide library. And these you can then use to create presentations, quizzes, assessment modules. Uh, but we'll just focus on the presentation for today. The presentation will allow you to create these presentations. So let's say you want to create a presentation and you label it A, B, C, D, E, create. And then you can import your slides from the library. So you can either import your slides from the slide box or the public library. So you could just go to the public library. You could go to oral and you could select all your cases from there. So if I pick, I could select as many cases as I like, or I could also search slides. So if I want to search for a slide, I could just go to the, again to the public library and then put in, uh, put in the diagnosis that I'm looking for. And I would be able to see the slides and whichever slide I like, then I can then use that slide for my presentation. You can drag and drop and put the slides in whatever order. You can upload your PowerPoints and once, uh, and you can then share these slides with the, the entire world. So if you want to send these slides to the world to preview them like Marwa did, you just copy the link and you can then put it in the, you can send them in a link to the, in an email. And people would then, if you look at the chat, you will be able to see these slides when you click on this link. So people can preview these slides and then you can add a PowerPoint. And once your PowerPoint is added, you can then use this for teaching. So the next day when you come in, you're going to just open up your slide. You launch your presentation like Marwa did just today. And then this becomes like a multi ed sc scope that you're using for teaching because this is like a digital slide. And then the entire world is looking at you or to use so it is like almost like an infinite head scope that you're teaching off from this. And that is what makes it very powerful because it combines the conference room teaching with a multi head scope teaching. Uh, and there is really no excuse because there are thousands and thousands of slides in the slide library. So even if you don't have a scanner, you don't have any kind of uh, uh, software program, the, everything is available on pathpresenter.net. You just log in from any device anywhere in the world and you can start teaching from today itself. Uh, you can also use the high yield cases to learn and teach pathology. The high yield cases have been built by experts from all around the world. So if you go to the oral pathology section that actually Marwa helped in creating. So here she's again. And these are like cases, bread and butter cases that have been picked by the experts which you can come in and look at them. So if you click on any of these cases, uh, you will be able to see these cases first blindly. Or so you can project this on the screen if you're in the department. Or if you're at home, you open this on your iPad, you open this on your phone, anything. You look at the slide. Then you can click on the case info button. It will give you the diagnosis. It will give you the microscopic features. And again, they are linked to the slide. So you will. it's almost like Marwa sitting and teaching you on a multi-edit scope. All these features are linked to the slides, so you can see them for differential diagnosis. The slides can be seen side by side for comparison. So a very useful tool to do like for self-learning. So that is the uh, high yield section that you saw there. You can go in, you can also go in and like uh, play around with it. You can create your presentations. And I'm going to share a video link with you, which will actually give you all the, uh, so let me go back here, video details. So this is a video that will give you like, a, I'm just going to put this in the chat. So it's, so it's a 10 minute tour of the entire platform. That will give you all the features. So if you look at this video, it will give you all the features that you can use on the platform. And the last thing that I would like to show you is this conference platform that we recently launched. So this is the conferences.pathpresenter.net. 
Uh, you can go to events. If you go to the events, you will be able to register for the most recent conference that we did. And once you log in after registering, uh, I'll just uh, very quickly show you the lectures that have been put here by experts from all around the world. So you go to conferences, create manage conference. And this is the masterclass in pathology that we recently just completed. And there are like four talks on head and neck pathology that might be very useful to you. And these were given by experts around the world. So you go to lectures. And uh, if you go to the head and neck pathology here, you can see there were complex lesions of the head and neck by uh, Steve from Germany. Complex like again by Abbasi from Germany. Then there was one theory, one on thyroid tumors and then approach to the cystic lesions of the jaw. So when you click on any of these, you will be able to preview the slides first if you want to preview the slides. And then once you have previewed the slides, you would be able to hear the talks. So the slides are here. You can see all the slides here that Marwa used for a talk. And then once you have previewed the slides, you can go back and then listen to the pre-recorded video. So that is a very quick overview of the platform. So if you have any questions, I will be very ha happy to answer any questions for you. Dr. Raj, that's an excellent uh, work from your side uh, to elevate the teaching in uh, pathology. Absolutely, it's a delight to see the changes that are coming into the digital platforms. Uh, and I think uh, there is a question from Dr. Jose. Dr. Jose, I think you can ask. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. This is actually, a, for me, a first-time encounter with Beth Presenter. I was already impressed with the quality on the, the link that was given to us prior to this, uh, this seminar. I've got a question for you. So you say this is a free platform, yep. and uh, you say there are already preloaded examples, but you can also use the platform in your own institution on the closed circuit. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's right, yeah. Okay. So, and, but you can import but you cannot import from the library, the worldwide library. You have to do uh, it live. If you, like if you go to any of the institutional platform that like Sloan or Yale or U Chicago or Nagasaki in Japan or Singapore, they have their own slides, but within, within the slide library, they also have access to all these slides that are in the public library. So they have okay. access to the 30,000 slides plus their own slides. Okay. You want, but one needs a slide scanner though. Uh, your own slide scanner to to generate uh, the the scan. Yeah. So one, if you if you like, if you have a slide scanner, which could be any of the scanners, you would be able to generate the scans and then upload them into the my slide box. But even if you don't have any scanner, there are like already 40, 30, 35 or thirty six thousand slides currently in the slide library that you can start using from today. So there is really no excuse for not using it because it's a free platform. The slides are available. There is no fee involved. And it is it can be uh, like opened up on any kind of device. So all you need is an internet and a computer. That's it. Well, can I ask you the, the, the format of the slide scanning? Is that any format? That, that any that format, yeah. Whether, whether it's a Perio SVS file, whether it's a Philip I syntax, whether it's a Hamamatsu NDPI, 3D Histec, uh, the MRSX, any any file format will be uploaded into the system. And, uh, and then, any PHI that is associated with the slide will not be seen on the system. So, so actually it converts all those different formats in yeah, one. So, yeah, we convert all of them into a single format. So the software in the backend will convert them into a single format and also remove any PHI. So you will never see any PHI that is associated. It is a HIPAA compliant platform. Uh, so we have taken a lot of care about security because when you try to work with these big institutions like Yale or U Chicago or Sloan, they are very, very particular about uh, patient security and HIPAA compliance. And we have taken extreme care to make sure that we clear all the security issues of any institution. Uh, what you just presented is of enormous consequence for Africa uh, because we've got nothing in place. Uh, we even haven't got anything in place in South Africa. We're looking at a digital platform. So everybody's got different slide scanner. Um, uh, what you call sky scanner formats and uh, to even across the national health and body service it's difficult to standardize it but if you say that you can use any scanner but this platform will just be 
universal, then it actually takes away the problem of having to tender for, let's say, 10, 12 scanners in one where each institution can use their own one and then basically use the system internally for their own institution in the country and then obviously for the rest of the world. But yeah, in the, in the yes, in the last conference that we did, we had 42 speakers from like almost uh, 12 countries and all of them use different file formats. So uh, you said there's a video that explains this all? Uh, yeah, I, can put I, it in the I put it in the chat actually. Oh, yeah, I need to send this to my, my, my expert committee members here in South Africa because we arrived on the verge of actually implementing or looking for tender of our system. And it turned out to be very expensive. But I think before Paul made it, so it's a lot less expensive. You know, you and, need we, and we are academic pathologists, so like we have tried to keep the cost as low as possible because the, the goal was to build a platform that will allow to democratize resources and, and knowledge. Yes, there is a lot of cost involved because it is cloud-based and we have to have a lot of technology in the backend. So there, so we, there is a little bit of cost involved when you try to build an institutional version of the platform, but it is very, very like compared to any other thing in the world, what you, like if you want, if you buy a scanner, it is almost like a hundred to $200,000 for the scanner. And this is like not even 10% of that price. Basically. The actual demo takes around 45 to one minutes to one hour to show you all the features. And once any department sees the demo, it's a very, very easy thing to understand that this is what we need to use. Password and password and registration differs for every platform yeah. like for conferences or it can. So we are working on a single sign-on right now. When we started this off, we didn't realize we'll have to build different platforms for different use cases. We would be able to just sign on, on use a single username and password to sign on all of them. This is so in keeping with the amazing time that we are in, because I think a year back, uh, something even like what I'm doing today would not have been possible. Getting information and experts from around the world on one platform to speak and to make it available. And now this is the second half. So you have the knowledge, you also need the technology. And that was why I was so taken up by what Dr. Raj once got in touch with me and uh, I think we've been planning this lecture for some time. Uh, it's amazing. This is a totally amazing platform and I definitely hope more of us can get on it. Now I have one question, Dr. Raj. Uh, from the institutes that are already with you, are there any from India? Now the reason I'm asking this is because most of us don't have obviously access to uh, full slide scanners in India. But if we know which are the hospitals who have it, we can try and, you know, get things done through them. Yeah, currently the, the, there are discussions going on with Tata. So the Tata Cancer Center, but there's still discussion only. But there is no real institution that is using it as a, as a closed system within the institution as of now. Okay. So somebody Singa has to buy the first one. Yeah, somebody Singapore has to buy the first scanner. <laughs> No, there are quite a few scanners now, like HCG, Dr. Reddy's, or like the group, Apollo group, all of them have now gone into the, even the private like Metropolis and uh, SRL, Ranbaxi, all of them have now gone into digital scanning quite a bit. Uh, because one thing that I can very, like that might be very, very useful to the audience here. Let me share my screen just one second. Yes. Uh, because that might be a very useful tool that I think will, which will resonate. So when you go to Path Presenter, uh, dot net basically and let's say i want uh, i want to send a case to mandana to just like get her opinion on uh, so it is just one click of a button so i'm, I'm going to upload my case into the my slide box so let's say i want to send this case to her for an opinion so i'm just going to take this copy this link and then just put it in the chat box here so i would just send it to her in an email and she would be able to open this slide on her phone basically. Or, so if you click on this link, you're going to open this slide and she can call me back and immediately say like, this is what I think Raj and I'll, I'll give you a more detailed report tomorrow. So it, it's a very quick way to get a second opinion. And secondly, let's say if you're, if you're writing a book chapter or a, so you can just, just download this QR code and you can put this on a poster that you're presenting at a meeting. You can put this in a book chapter or a journal article. So right now also, if you have a phone, you, you can just open your phone 
open your camera on your phone and scan this on your phone and you will be able to open the slide and then use your two fingers to zoom like zoom in zoom out rotate the slide basically you can try it now if you have a phone in your hand right now and you will be able to open the slide with without even logging into the system so it provides a very uh, easy way to share cases and like get a second opinion from some colleague around the world that is wonderful now, one more thing now like for example someone like me yeah as you know right now my whole day goes in front of a computer screen mm -hmm. with lesser and lesser access to actual cases so in which case now supposing for one of my research i want to look at a specific cell and i'm going to go through your slides and just you know check it up there uh, how does it work can i actually use those slides which are in the public library for research yeah like you can use them because uh, when people are uploading the slides and then donating it to the spark present library so it doesn't count towards the storage and we are paying for all that storage and the only terms and conditions is that these, these cases can be used by anybody around the world for education uh, we haven't put anything specific for research as of now because we don't want to use people's slides for research uh, it's mostly based for only for education education and teaching <clears throat> and conferencing uh, but uh, we don't want to use it for any kind of research because we haven't gotten that permission uh, from the people that are uploading the slides there okay so that that is still not possible yeah at least not we cannot like permit the research use people sometimes use it without our permission but we cannot permit the research use okay now well, that's that's a different thing yeah yeah uh, dr raj is mostly for education yeah dr raj i think uh, dr merwa has to say something yeah please uh, Thank you. Just I want to say a few words for the PET presenter. I also use the PET presenter in my general pathology and oral pathology practice lessons. It's very, it is really useful, and the students like to use their phones. Just I show my screen uh, on the lessons. They follow me with their phones uh, instead of to using microscope. They love it. And before the pandemic, uh, I uh, used to. Um, uh, I uh, started to use this platform, and during the pandemic, all my practical lessons goes to well because we all know that it is platform, and the, all my lessons made with the pet presenter. I really uh, want to thank the Dr. Raj for this opportunity. Also for the research, uh, we made a very uh, large international uh, research with PET presenter. We upload all cases, uh, approximately 300 cases with our uh, special box. And at the same time around the world, we see the, each other cases the same time and we make an inter-observer uh, shape with the Lycan Planus. Uh, and uh, we can also use this platform or own research. Just I want to add it. Thank you. That's Thank you. yeah. That's true. Like if you want to use it for your own research, we are, but like any slides that have been donated to the library cannot be used for research. It's mostly for education and conferencing. Okay. Okay. So, so it's a confined uh, area within the path uh, presented again. Like if you are putting slides into the my slide box, you can keep them private or you can share them with the library. So if you keep them private. Uh, there is a payment involved because uh, initially it was free, but then people started misusing the storage. And there were some people that uploaded like thousands and thousands of slides and did not want to share it to the library. So then we had to go back and like change the way you can keep the slides there. So if you donate it to the public library, then it's a free storage. But if you're going to keep it in a private storage and not share it with the library just for one use, then you have to pay for the storage. Because there was a month that I paid twenty-two thousand dollars for somebody who uploaded a four thousand slides in a month. And uh, Dr. Raj, you have uh, a different versions of the path presenter, uh, and in fact, uh, the clinical trials and other things in relation to the pharma part. Yeah. Okay. So there are multiple so, different. Yeah, those are closed systems which people have to like subscribe to to use because uh, they 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 can show you the PHI. They can show you a lot of metadata that is associated with the patient. And to, to get access to that kind of data, you have to jump through a lot of loopholes and security issues before you can access those cases. So you have to be part of a very small closed <coughs> organization that is using that kind of tools. Okay. And uh, Tataraj, it seems to be a very encouraging one, the, the way uh, the platform was built. Because Dr. Mandana knows uh, 
earlier discussion with her, my intention to make uh, the department to more of digital one uh, at some point of time. Uh, I think I remember, madam. So it is a little costly affair when it comes to digitalization. So we inquired uh, uh, the digital scanner uh, cost uh, related to at least to make it into the minimum uh, uh, to uh, the teaching side. But uh, this one, absolutely, I think it's replacing that idea itself. I can absolutely oh, yeah. use it. You can start using digital pathology for all your education from today itself. You don't need a scanner. In the ultimate, you'll need a scanner to for your own cases. But right, if sir. you really want to start using it for education, you can start it today. Actually, there's no, there's no, there's nothing stopping you from doing it. Yes. Uh, Dr. Raghu wants to say something. Raghu, you're on mute. You're muted, uh, sir. Uh, thank you, Ravi. Uh, and Dr. Raj, as uh, Ravi was mentioning, I think uh, we should start using this platform. I know that not many institutions or the labs have uh, uh, the provision to scan the slides completely and upload it as uh, of today, because I was also inquiring the uh, cost of the Aperio scanner. It's way too expensive. Yeah, way too expensive. Uh, but then since uh, uh, there are slides which are already uploaded on the platform, I think it's really encouraging uh, for some of us uh, who would want to introduce digital pathology to our students. Yeah. So it's a blessing in disguise. Thanks, Mundana, for organizing this. You're welcome. Yes, this was a, a thoroughly, you know, every time, it all depends and it's all their work of all the people who present on the platform and, and it, it makes on the channel it makes all the difference and that is just what adds to the whole thing it's uh i think i have this shared thought process that with dr rajan that is that we believe that education should be easily available and training and it should not be caught and you know hindered by geography or by access and uh, one thing this whole thing I think last year brought many sad things but did make it possible I think we have we might be doing social distancing but we are definitely created digital proximization <laughs> now we are a lot more accessible to each other and this definitely can go on this is this uh, platform this is, is brought is wonderful it, it can do a lot it can do a lot and I Hope we'll find microscopes in India where we can also begin to, you know, scan because I know we have a wealth of cases here. Okay. You know, that if we can begin to actually add them to the library, that also would be really great, not just for us, but for everybody around the world. Right. I was just uh, thinking, uh, are you considering uh, having a network of uh, universities as part of uh, one consortium. I mean, I'm just uh, speaking from the oral pathologist's perspective and at least organize a global virtual classroom uh, because uh, I think some of us who logged into this channel and some of us who are uh, working closely with Mandana uh, have the benefit of uh, uh, watching this particular platform live. And I think, you know, if you can actually organize a global virtual classroom just for Indian oral pathologists, either through uh, Mandana's channel or uh, otherwise. I think uh, uh, this message could be disseminated to the larger audience. No, it would be like anything that we can do to promote education, like I'm all for it. Like I work 24 seven on this, so I'm all for it. Like we just finished a conference of, I just I showed you that conferences.pathpresenter.net where we finished this conference just last weekend. Uh, Marva was one of the esteemed speakers on that. So 42 speakers coming from like almost 10 to 15 countries. Uh, 7,800 people registered on that conference. So wow. there's a lot of people that are coming and looking at these conferences from all around the world. So if, if you go to that conferences.pathpresenter.net and you click on that events page, you will be able to register and see all the slides, preview them. And then once you have previewed them, you will be able to go through all the talks. And they are really spectacular talks by the the best of the best speakers around the world. That is true. 
definitely that it was all a very very interesting actually extremely interesting and one more thing is now i have met dr rajendra through linkedin my definite suggestion to all of you is please connect with him on linkedin <laughs> because he does put up all these things what like this conference was actually the information was running on linkedin i think for over a month and uh, anyone who saw it could have just taken part so the whole thing is about having the right information about what is happening where and when so for that you need to get in touch with him and he's on linkedin so please locate him on linkedin and connect with him that will help you a lot and, and uh, you know what's happening <laughs> yeah i'm a dermatopathologist i'm a skin pathologist so my email is skinpathology@gmail.com very easy to remember <laughs> so you can send me an email anytime skinpathology@gmail.com so just think... one question yes please yes sorry i'm sure that you worked on the bandwidth problem so yeah, uh, um, the bandwidth is 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 low i understand let's take it for each case like the bandwidth okay. the, the the way the software program has been built is that it will break up every slide into a million images <laughs> so when you are actually zooming into a slide you only open a specific like a very small fraction of those million images so actually the digital slide will open up much faster than a clinical image because the clinical image if you look if you saw the marwa's presentation the clinical image was actually taking a longer time to load than the the, the the pathology image because what we have done in the software is every slide that is in the back end has been broken down into million images and you only open up part of that million images when you're opening a digital slide and and your minimum minimum speed in kilobits per second what is your recommend minimum speed Like it, it works with very, very low speeds. Like there are people from Africa, the middle of Africa, where that we get like uh, people using it there. Even in the Fiji Islands, there's a whole classroom that runs on Fiji Island. Uh, the whole pathology group in the Fiji Islands is broken up into multiple different smaller, smaller groups all across the island, and it's in a remote area. But they they are actually using it as a as one of the platforms for their entire uh, teaching for the whole year. So it works quite well even in that remote areas in Fiji Island. Yes, this is great. Any other questions from anybody on the on Marwa's talk or on the path presenter? Anything? Ma'am, I have a question. Yeah, please turn on your camera and yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Ma'am, actually, I just wanted to know whether it, is it allowed on this platform to upload the pictures which are already. published as a case report or uh, if we have submitted the pictures here can we are we allowed to publish those pictures in the journals is it possible like we don't have any issue sometimes the journal might have an issue like they might they might not want to put those images anywhere else so you'll have to take okay. permission from the journal otherwise for path present it's an open platform we are not policing people what they're putting up but if you add anything to the slide library there is an editorial board that will look at it and then actually make sure that it is not some kind of a, a picture that should not go into the slide library and then once they approve it then it goes into the slide library okay okay it doesn't directly go into the slide library it has to go through a process okay thank you so much sir thank you for such a lovely platform sir uh, we thank just a uh, few couple of days i visited but it is truly mesmerizing slides <laughs> even uh, what dr narva have uh, put there it was amazing slides and what a beautiful platform i'm looking forward to seeing other uh, uh, things as well thank you so much thank you thank you for kind words i was just <laughs> telling him about you saying that it was a virtual treat yeah she is the one who said it <laughs> <laughs> yes ma'am truly like anywhere in any corner of the world anybody can access such beautiful slides so that is the best part of this virtual world say bye thank you have thank a lovely you time thanks a lot great thank being you. with you all bye okay. bye thank bye. you ragu thank you ravikant yeah thank for you. all your effort too bye
Thanks. Thank you, Mandana. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Marwa. Thank you. Bye.